So good afternoon, students. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Just on it. So, uh, in the fag end of our last class, we are discussing crystal field stabilization energy, and then I have told you, I have in, in fact discussed from D1 to D10. What is the in crystal field energy of the system and what is the crystal field stabilization energy? And I have written it uh, today here. So, crystal field stabilization energy may be taken as minus of the energy of the system in presence of a crystal field. That means for a D1, energy of the system in the octahedral crystal field with respect to the spherical field is minus 4 dq. So since energy of the system is minus 4 dq, so CFSC will be 4 dq. So similarly for D2, the crystal field energy is minus 8 dq and hence CFSC will be plus 8 dq and so on. And then we have seen that for D4 to D7, D4, D5, D6, D7, we have two possibilities. One is the so-called strong field case or the low spin complexes and other is the weak field case of the high spin complexes and for each of them we have seen what is the crystal field energy and correspondingly negative of that is the crystal field stabilization energy. So, and in each case we have seen that the whether it will be a, it will be a uh, um, uh, low spin or high spin, it depends on the this energy gap 10 dq minus p, right. In fact, I have written it somewhere else. So, so 10 dq minus p. This determines whether we will have a low spin complex or high spin complex. <clears throat> if 10 dq minus p <coughs> is positive, that means when 10 dq is much greater than p, in other words crystal field splitting is much greater than the pairing energy, then we will have a low spin complex. On the other hand, when 10 dq minus p uh, this is negative, right? When that is when P is more than 10 dq, we will have a high spin complex. So whether we, we will have a high spin complex or low spin complex, it determines on the, it depends on the relative energy difference between 10 dq and P. When 10 dq minus P is positive, then it will be low spin and when 10 dq minus p is negative you will have a high spin complex and this this actually occurs between d4 to d7 and then we have discussed that what is pairing energy i have told you that pairing energy has got two components one component is the coulombic repulsion component and that arises because when you pair two electrons, then the two electrons, which are ne each negatively charged, they they reside on, uh, almost in the same same space, and, and hence the repulsion between them increases. 
and other is the loss of exchange energy that means when the electrons are separated then there is a possibility of uh, exchanging the electron and exchange of electron leads to a decrease of the energy of the system that means it leads to stability like the resonance if you have more number of resonance structure you have more stability similarly if you have more number of exchanges possible you have more stability and when you force pair the uh, uh, electrons in the same orbital then the pairing decreases and as a result of this exchange energy is lost and this loss of exchange energy is manifested in terms of some positive energy that is the pairing energy so pairing energy has got two component one is the coulombic repulsion and other is the loss of exchange energy and i have demonstrated it here in terms of a d6 complex so for d6 high spin we have five unpaired electron and so we have 10 pairing possible where for d6 low spin we have three up spin electron and three down spin electron so for up spin electron you can have three this many three number of um, three number of possible exchange and for down spin electron you have additional three number of possible exchange so total exchange is six so as you can see that on going from high spin to low spin that means forcing the spin additional two electrons to be paired we find that there is a loss of exchange energy initially there were 10 exchanges possible now there are six exchanges so nine that means we are we are losing energy corresponding to stability uh, due to four exchanges right and that leads to uh, pairing energy and we have many applications of the pairing energy and one application i have shown it here that if i consider ferrous and manganese right ferrous is a d6 system manganese is a d5 system now we find that for ferrous uh, weak field ligand some we sometimes give low spin complexes for for but for manganese uh, the very uh, for manganese getting low spin complexes is very difficult and this is explained in terms of ferrous as we have discussed previously so it is a d6 system and so just as we have discussed previously so when you go from the high spin to the low spin system there is loss of four number of exchanges on the other hand if i go to d5 system like manganese right so for manganese in the high spin form uh, number of exchanges possible were 5 c2 that is 5 into 5 minus 1 by 2 whereas uh, in the case of in the case of low spin complex you can have uh, 3 c2 plus 2 c2 so 3 c2 plus 2 c2 and we find uh, total difference is six exchanges so whereas in case of ferrous that means d6 going from the high spin to low spin complex leads to loss of four number of exchanges here we find in case of manganese on going from the high spin to low spin complex there is loss of six exchanges so since the number of exchanges that is lost increases so that means pairing energy for manganese 2 will be much higher than pairing energy of ferrous and that's why because of the very high pairing energy of manganese we may say that whereas some relatively moderate field ligands can form can form uh, low spin complexes with ferrous but uh, for manganese 2 uh, same ligands cannot form low spin complexes they remain high spin for instance if i take bipedal ferrous bipedal or ferric bipedal complex ferrous bipedal complex uh, it will be low spin complex on the other hand manganese trees bipedal complex uh, you, that means three bipedal ligands are there it will it will be still high spin complex so manganese to low spin is very difficult to obtain because of its high pairing energy but for d6 system like ferrous it is relatively easier much easier to get low spin complexes <sighs> now remaining with say now we have taken a d4 system so, so for d4 system so this is the d4 system uh, when there is no crystal field the spherical field now we apply uh, the crystal field octagonal crystal field so there may be high spin complex and low spin complex and i have written the energy of the crystal field and also the crystal field stabilization energy 
So as you can see that whereas for the high spin system crystal field stabilization energy is 6 dq for the low spin system crystal field stabilization energy is 16 dq minus p so whether it will be high spin or low spin is dependent on dependent on the uh, difference between dq and p if dq is much larger then 16 dq minus p will be uh, will be very high and so low spin will be favored on the other hand <coughs> if p is much larger then uh, this high spin complex will be favored right now as you can see here for uh, for d4 system high spin there are four unpaired electron and so whether it is a high spin complex or low spin complex can very well be understood using the magnetic property of the of the metal complexes so if you measure magnetic moment of a d4 complex like like say chromium 2 plus um, uh, you can easily see because here we have four unpaired electron so you will have you will have magnetic moment equal to 4.8 board magneton right on the other hand when you have low spin complex then you have only two unpaired electron so magnetic moment is 2.8 board magneton so one of the easiest way of identifying a high spin and low spin complex is to uh, is to study their magnetic moment and magnetic moment will give you number of unpaired electron and because we know more for one unpaired electron it is 1.7 for two unpaired electron it is 2.8 similarly for four unpaired electron it is 4.8 and so on formula is root over n into n plus 2 where n is the number of unpaired electrons so we may say that uh, sorry magnetic moment uh, magnetic moment equal to uh, magnetic moment equal to uh, unfortunately uh, I, don't, I don't know why it is not writing okay leave it so magnetic um, magnetic moment equal to a root over n into n plus 2 where n is the number of unpaired electron and uh, and from that we can calculate what is the magnetic moment but there may be some cases where uh, here we have plotted actually energy of the system versus 10 dq so as you can see that that the uh, for the high spin system since the energy is minus 6 dq so it with increase of dq or 10 dq its energy will fall but with a slope of minus 6 on the other hand for low spin complex it is 16 dq minus p so since dependent it is very much dependent on 10 dq 16 dq so you see for the low spin complex the energy falls with increase of 10 dq by a by a by a much larger slope right so in this region say with low 10 dq value low crystal field strength you can easily see that the high spin form has got the high spin form has got the so this is the high spin form blue this is the high spin form has got the lower energy so high spin will be more stable on the other hand for high crystal field the violet color of uh, this line uh, we'll, we'll have lower energy that means low spin form will be more stable but as you can see here there will be some crossing point and in this crossing around this crossing point you can see that the energy between low spin and high spin is very small and this kind of thing arises when when we have 10 dq is nearly equal to p that means in the in the when you vary the ligands, there may be some crystal fields where 10 dq value and p is very much uh, near to each other, very much comparable to each other. So that this energy gap 10 dq minus p, whether it is positive or negative, doesn't matter. But absolute value of 10 dq plus minus p is comparable to that of KT thermal energy. And as a result of this, within this kind of region where the high spin and low spin system has got comparable energy and this energy gap can be bridged by bridged by thermal energy we can have a situation where we have so called spin equilibrium 
spin equilibrium means we have a equilibrium between high spin and low spin systems as we can as we have said uh, so it will we have a high spin low spin equilibrium high spin low spin equilibrium or a spin crossover complex right so both name are applicable some some books call it high spin low spin equilibrium some books call it spin crossover phenomena so spin crossover phenomena or high spin low spin equilibrium this is observed in that region of 10 dq where the crystal field stabilization energy or 10 dq the crystal field splitting is comparable to that of pairing energy in this region the energy gap between the low spin high spin complex is very small and it can be bridged by thermal energy theoretically though it both side of this both side of this graph uh, corresponds to high spin low spin equilibrium but experimentally it is found only high spin low spin equilibrium is obtained in this part of the graph that means where where the low spin has got slightly lower energy high spin has got the slightly higher energy and this energy gap is comparable to that of kt uh, reason is that uh, okay we may not go into the details reason but i can tell you that high spin complexes has got slightly higher entropy so even if they are energetically sometimes the low spin complex is favored but in this region uh, the entropy factor will bridge the will make ultimately high spin complex more favorable so high spin low spin phenomena is generally not observed in this region but high spin low spin equilibrium is observed in this region where invariably low spin has got slightly lower energy high spin has got, uh, high spin system has got slightly higher energy and we have this energy gap which is comparable to kt so in this cases you will have a spin equilibrium or high spin low spin equilibrium complex or a, or a spin crossover phenomenon why we are calling it spin crossover because if you measure the magnetic moment with respect to temperature right we will find that at low temperature when kt is very small then low spin will be uh, will be completely uh, occupied so you will have low magnetic moment now because number of one pair electron is small then as you go on increasing the temperature you will find at certain temperature there is rapid change like the acid based hydration there is a rapid change of the system and it it actually transits to the uh, high spin form so and this particular temperature at which there is a short transition it is called the critical temperature at critical temperature there is sudden jump from the low spin to high spin form right and this is a very important phenomena and in fact this has got many applications particularly in memory devices because in memory devices you have the high spin which has got the high magnetic moment low spin low magnetic moment and this magnetic proper change of magnetic property is used for a uh, memory devices uh for recording uh, for recording purposes and so as we have shown here now so magnetic moment for high spin is 4.84 mag 4.8 mag board magneton for d4 system magnetic moment for for the low spin system is 2.8 board magneton now if we have a high spin low spin equilibrium then in that case <coughs> the what is the magnetic moment now when we want to obviously magnetic moment will be sorry mag magnetic moment magnetic moment will be uh, uh, will be your average value right now please remember magnetic please remember magnetic moment is a vector quantity so suppose we have a we have a collection of molecules where we have high spin plus low spin now if i want to so we have a so there is a high, in other words there is a high spin low spin equilibrium depending on temperature there will be some fraction of high spin there will be some fraction of low spin now if i ask you find out the magnetic moment of the whole system theoretically we can add magnetic moment of the high spin and low spin but since magnetic moment is is, is a vector quantity so obviously you have to add with the sign but we don't know 
in which direction high spin molecules are oriented in which direction low spin molecules are oriented in other words we do not know the exact direction of the high spin molecule and low spin molecules so some so if i want to find out mu of the system what you have to do instead of addition of the magnetic moment uh, if i take mu square mu square becomes scalar so mu square may be additive but mu is not additive so if i want to get magnetic moment of the system it is better to consider the square of the magnetic moment and we write mu square the molar magnetic moment uh, is equal to suppose n into mu square of the high spin where n is the mole fraction of the of the molecules which are in the high spin state plus 1 minus n 1 minus n will then be mole fraction of the molecules in the low spin state into mu square low spin so if someone ask you what is the magnetic moment of the ensemble which contains which contains say uh, i give you uh, uh, i give you 20 20 moles of the system out of that say 10 mole are in the high spin state and and 20 moles uh, so a total if the total mole is 30 moles say say we have a collection of molecule which contain 30 moles say i i tell you that 10 moles are high spin and say 20 moles are low spin right so and i ask you tell me what will be the magnetic moment of this ensemble so what do you have to do mole fraction is then here is uh, 10 by 3 here is 20 by 3 so it will be mu square of the system magnetic moment of the ensemble will be n the mole fraction for the high spin what is the mole fraction 10 divided by total number of mo molecules so 10 by 30 that means 1/3 mu square high spin plus 2/3 mu square low spin this will give you the magnetic moment right just as here i have written it here so mu square experimental right it will be equal to n where n is the mole fraction of the low spin n mu square low spin plus 1 by 1 minus n mu square high spin so if someone ask you to calculate the magnetic moment of a high spin low spin equilibrated system you have to take square of the magnetic moment rather than the magnetic moment itself uh, for instance we take this particular complex fe fen2 nch2 this is a classical molecule ferrous molecule uh, which has got which has which shows high spin low spin equilibrium now since it is a ferrous it is a d6 system so in the low spin state it is t2g6 and it is diamagnetic in the high spin state it is t2g4 eg2 so there are a uh, four unpaired electron this four electron paramagnetic okay and the ligand is two phenanthrene and two thiocyanate phenanthrene ligand is this right so there are uh, two pyridine moieties and then there is a benzene ring fused with it so it is a uh, you can see tri aromatic i mean tricyclic compound right there are three rings which are fused to each other <coughs> now we find suppose experimentally that at low temperature say around 30 kelvin uh complex is mainly in the low, or predominantly or completely in the low spin form and so it is diamagnetic magnetic moment is zero and we find they say at certain other temperature high temperature like say 320k say complex is fully in the high spin form it is paramagnetic and its magnetic moment is 4.8 bohr magneton right now i give you a data that it is experimentally found that at 200k that means in between 30k and 320k the observed magnetic moment is 2.2 bohr magneton and i ask you to find out what is the mole fraction of the high spin complex and what is the mole fraction of the low spin complex as 200k so i have given you three data one is at 30k at very low temperature complex is diamagnetic at 
sufficiently high temperature at around 320k complex is paramagnetic and with the magnetic moment this and at a certain intermediate temperature say 200k the complex has got magnetic moment equal to 2.2 bohr magneton and i ask you that what is the uh, relative proportion of the low spin and high spin complexes at 200k so your approach is that our formula is mu square experimental equal to mole fraction of the you can i take either low spin or high spin so mole fraction of the high spin into mu square of high spin plus 1 minus n mu square low spin etc so now mu square experimental is given to you 2.2 square right and say at 200k if i assume that mole fraction of the of the high spin complex is n so n into 4.8 square plus 1 my 1 minus n into 0 so from this you can easily find out n and you can say what is the mole fraction of the low spin complex and what's, what is the mole fraction of the high spin complex or the problem may be the other way suppose i tell you that the high spin form has got this magnetic moment low spin form has got this magnetic moment and say i i tell you that at 200k uh, say i give you what is the mole fraction of the high spin complex and what is the mole fraction of the low spin complex and i ask you to find out the magnetic moment of the system at 200k so again in that case i have given you the mole fraction or and you have to you know what is the mu value so you have to find out mu square experimental uh, that is expected right so using this equation if i give you the magnetic moment values you can find out the mole fraction at a given temperature or in a reverse way if i give you the magnetic moment value and the mole fraction at a given temperature you, you should be able to find out what is the expected magnetic moment at that given temperature okay so this kind of high spin low spin equilibrium is very important from exam point of view as well as from practical application point of view so go through previous some previous question papers you will find some questions like this and be prepared for that okay <clears throat> next we go to Next, we go to this kind of system where uh, we have instead of pure octahedral crystal field, say we have a complex like this. So here it is cobalt, cobalt three. So we have drawn the we have written the complex as this. this kind of system where a and n may be ethylene date may be a simple ethylene diamine light like say nh2 or it may be a, even in n may be a bipedal also right to address bipedal or phenanthrolene uh, this may be also the case bipedal or phenanthrolene so <coughs> So we are considering instead of pure octahedral complex, what is called axial field ligand, where the axial ligands are weaker than the equatorial ligand. So in the basal plane, in the equatorial plane, we have relatively stronger ligand, and in the axial ligands, relatively weaker, like say halite. Say here we have written fluoride. So what will happen? Because the axial ligands are weaker, so they will be splitting both in the EG and T2G set. The weaker ligands the, occupy the Z axis. So obviously the, the orbitals which has got Z component will feel less repulsion compared to orbitals which has got XY component. So in the, in the EG set, 
we have x square minus y square and z square. Now, since ligands along z axis are relatively weaker, so we find that the z square orbital is feeling less repulsion. So there is a splitting. There, there is a splitting between x square minus y square and z square, and z square goes lower in energy. Just one minute. Uh, hello. আচ্ছা আপনি আসুন আমি ক্লাস আমি ক্লাসে আছি আমার তিনটে কুড়ি অব্দি ক্লাস ঠিক আছে তারপর আমি কথা বলছি সিমিলারলি উই হ্যাভ এ টি টু ই সেট ইন দ্য টি টু ই সেট উই হ্যাভ এক্স জে দ্যাট দিস টু ওর বাইটাল এক্স জেড ওয়াই জেড হ্যাজ গট জেড কম্পোনেন্ট এক্স ওয়াই হ্যাজ গট হ্যাভ গট নো ডেড জেড কম্পোনেন্ট সো এক্স জেড এন্ড ওয়াই জেড সিন্স দে হ্যাভ দ্য জেড কম্পোনেন্ট দে আর এনার্জি ডিক্রিজেস and x y consequently increases so there is a splitting further of the t2g energy the orbitals containing the z component its energy decreases and the orbitals which has got x and y component their energy increases so this kind of ligand field is called a four plus two ligand field that means four strong ligand in the in the basal plane or equatorial plane and two weaker ligands in the axial axial uh, along the z axis right so this is called a sometimes called 4 plus 2 or more often it is called axial ligand field right axial ligand field or axial symmetry um, ligand field of axial symmetry meaning along the axial direction there is ligand field is slightly different compared to the equatorial position Usually, axial ligands are weaker ligands in most of the cases. In rare cases, they are stronger than the equatorial. So, usually, the axial ligands are weaker, and for them, you have this kind of crystal field, right? So, uh, four plus two coordination. That means four ligands relatively more strongly bound. The they are metal ligand distance is relatively shorter, and these two ligands, uh, they are metal ligand distance relatively longer because they are weaker ligands. And for them, the crystal field splitting will be like this. So you have to remember this. What is the axial symmetry? Now, in this way, if we go further, and ultimately, if I take out the two axial ligands, when the two axial ligands completely goes out. So in this case, since the axial ligands are weaker, so that means metal ligand bond distance along the axial direction is much larger. It must be much long, longer compared to the equatorial distance. Now, in this way, if you approach gradually, if you gradually increase the metal ligand distance along the axial position, and finally, if you take out the x completely, this two x completely, so that we get a square planar complex. So when I take away the ligands along z axis completely, so d z square get more stabilized, x z y z gets more stabilized. x y get more destabilized and x square minus y square get more destabilized so this is the ligand field for the square planar complex so for a square planar complex we find since the there is no ligand along z axis so you find that the x z y z and z square these are the two lowest energy orbitals and x y and x square minus y square are two relatively higher energy orbitals so for square planar complex what is the crystal field splitting it can be easily obtained if you go step by step first of all go from the octahedral to 4 plus 2 coordination and then from the 4 plus 2 coordination you remove these two loose ligands two relatively weaker ligands further and you get the four coordinate complex the four coordinate complex this z orbital is fixed uh, is this z square orbital is further stabilized x z y z is further stabilized and in order to maintain the bari center so x y is destabilized x square minus y square is destabilized so for uh, for square planar complex this is the energy splitting diagram x z y z is a lower energy then z square then x y x square minus y square now this is the energy diagram generally for fast transition metal square planar complex in some books you may get slightly different diagram because if you go to the second and third transition metals they are the stabilization is so much 
that you may get this kind of diagram that means z square is further stabilized and then we have x z y z and then we have say x y and then we have x square as y square so in some books there may be a reversal of z square and x z y z this is this kind of energy diagram is generally found for the second and third transient metal ions but for the first transient metal ions where we have most of the complexes this diagram is okay so for square planar complex you have to write this energy diagram where where x z y z is a degenerate set and it occupies the lowest energy then we have dz square and then we have x y and x square and z square and it can be shown from crystal field calculation that 10 dq value here corresponds to this splitting x y and x square minus z square so 10 dq value in this case corresponds to x y and x square minus z square energy gap this is the 10 dq value or the delta value crystal field splitting is given by this particular value okay so we have seen octahedral we have seen crystal field for the octahedral complex we have seen crystal field for the axial ligands or 4 plus 2 coordination and uh, or the axial geometry and then we have seen crystal field uh, diagram for the square planar complex so for all of them you must uh, you must practice it so that you can write the proper crystal field diagram <coughs> Next, we move to a very important phenomena called Yantilar effect. Now, please, for for ninety percent students, when they write in exam, uh, they write it as John Taylor effect. They write it as John Taylor. Now, this is not John Taylor, right? J O H N not. It is J H N. The actually. It, it is actually ordered as Ian Taylor effect, right? So Ian Taylor effect. And what is the statement of the Ian Taylor effect? You are familiar to some extent with the Ian Taylor effect in the, in the again, the uh, school living uh, during the 11, 12. It, it, the proper statement tells us that in any nonlinear molecule, so first thing that to apply the Ian Taylor effect or the Ian Taylor phenomena, uh, you have to have a non-linear molecule. That means if you have a say complex like say Mx2, there you cannot apply Antelar effect or Antelar uh, and, um, and phenomena. Antelar phenomena will be applicable for non-linear molecules like say octahedral molecule, tetrahedral molecule, etc. etc. So for any non-linear molecule in a degenerate electronic state. Right in a degenerate electronic state, it will be unstable and it will undergo some kind of distortion to lower its symmetry and split the degeneracy. So, if in any nonlinear molecule there is electronic degeneracy that is inherently unstable and that will undergo some degree of distortion to to split the degeneracy to leave the degeneracy and why it does so because by by undergoing this distortion and by by splitting the degeneracy the energy of the system is decreased so as as you will see here how the energy of the system decreases so yeah, the basic driving force of the antler effect is that that when we have a degenerate electronic state and this degeneracy arises due to the symmetry reason then molecule try for a nonlinear molecule uh, the molecule tries to distort the symmetry in such a way that to some extent molecule is distorted and degeneracy is to some extent lifted or split it and in this way the molecule achieves more stability. Now let us examine it by uh, a proper example. So here we have a pure octahedral complex. We have T2GEG. Okay. Classes. Now, suppose we, we take the simplest system D1 system. D1 system. So for D1, we have T2G1. Now T2G1 means T2G has got three orbitals. Uh, the XZ, YZ and XY. 
So when you say d1, that means one unpaired electron, there is three kind of there is there are three degeneracies. So you may have the configuration may be say xz1, and there is no electron in the yz xy. It may be yz1 or it may be xy1. So you may put this one electron either in the xz orbital or in the yz orbital or in the xy orbital so there is a orbital degeneracy and this orbital degeneracy is arising because of symmetry reason because in octahedral symmetry these three orbitals are of identical energy and that's why you have this kind of electronic degeneracy that is you can put the electron unpaired electron either in the xz or yz or xy now, Yantler effect tells us, or Yantler theorem tells us, that in such a case, molecule will undergo distortion and it will leave the degeneracy. So, starting from the octahedral, distortion may be, uh, may be mainly in the two directions. One is, as I have seen, uh, shown you here, there is the uh, axial elongation, right? So, axial elongation, that means, that means the ligands along z-axis goes uh, further away from the metal arm and as a result of this axial elongation as we have seen xz yz decreases in energy xy increases in energy z square decreases in energy and x square minus y square increases in energy and uh, we may say if the splitting between xy and xz xz yz is delta 2 then uh, this energy is decreased by one third delta 2, this energy is increased by two third delta 2, and if the energy gap between these two are delta 1, and then this energy is half delta 1, this is decreased by half delta 1, this is increased by half delta 1. So, there is one possibility that there is axial elongation. But there is also the other possibility, the axial compression, where the axial ligands are compressed. That means the metal ligand bond distance along the axial positions are shorter than the metal ligand bond distance in the equatorial position. In that case, since the Z ligands are compressed, obviously the Z orbitals will be delocalized. So you find Z square go up in energy now, X square minus Y square goes down in energy and you have similar splitting plus half delta 1 minus half delta 1 and now XZ, YZ will be up in energy and xy will be lower energy and so this energy is now stabilized by two third this energy is now destabilized by one third right now question is for d1 for instance which one is more probable or which one is more likely to occur because yandela theorem tells you that to leave the degeneracy there will be distortion but it does not tell you in which direction distortion will occur, whether there will be compression or elongation, it does not tell you and you have to calculate it in terms of energy. Now you can see that if, if I assume there is axial elongation, then the unpaired electron will be here. And what is the energy of the system? How much energy is decreased? It is equal to minus one third delta 2. On the other hand, <coughs> <coughs> if I assume there is axial compression, then one unpaired electron will be put here. And what is the energy of the system? It is stabilized by minus two third delta two. So you can see here that from pure energy consideration, we find that for D1 system, for D1 system, axial compression leads to stabilization of two third delta two. Axial elongation leads to uh, energy stabilization by one third delta two. So in any case, distortion, as I have told you, distortion, why distortion is occurring? Distortion leads to lowering of energy. How much lowering of energy is occurring? If it is, if it is elongation, energy is lowered by one third delta two. If it is compression, energy is lowered by two third delta two. Obviously, since in compression, the energy is decreased more. So uh, from pure 
free pure theoretical ground or if we consider only this aspect we should say that for d1 complex when when there is there is antler distortion there will be axial compression compared to axial elongation so there will be more chance it is actually compressed rather than it is elongated and in fact this has been experimentally verified for some of the d1 complexes so for d1 complexes Axial elongation is more suitable than axial. Uh, axial axial um, um, uh, no, compression is more suitable than axial elongation. Now, if I go to D2, what happens? If I go to D2, then obviously, since, so suppose here, so there are two orbitals. So for D2, if it is axial elongation, right? We have two electrons, one in the XZ and the one in the YZ. So energy of the system is minus two third delta two. On the other hand, if we have axial compression in a D2, then one electron is put here and another electron is put here because the energy gap is so small that you cannot have pairing. So one electron will be put here in the XY and another electron will be either in the XZ or YZ. So what is the energy of the system? Energy of the system is minus two third delta two plus one third delta two. So that means equal to minus one third delta two. So as you, as you can see for D2 system, axial elongation leads to lowering of energy and axial compression leads to less decrease of energy. So you see from D1 to D2, the system changes or the nature of the distortion changes. Whereas for D1 system, axial compression leads to more decrease of energy. So that is the favorable way of distortion. For, for D2 system, we find that axial elongation leads to more stability and axial compression leads to less stability. So axial elongation is more the preferred pathway. So in this way, as I have told you, since the antler effect does not, or the antler theorem does not tell you in which direction the distortion will be occurring. So whether it will be compression or elongation, that you have to calculate using the crystal field diagram. Now, uh, Today I shall not proceed further, but we can we can prepare a diagram like this. We can prepare a diagram like this, where we have considered the D, D, D systems and we have considered what are their crystal field uh, crystal field uh, structure or crystal field uh, configuration in presence of in presence of weak field and uh, strong field. That means high spin and low spin, and here we have written whether have, there will be uh, gentler distortion, gentler distortion or not, and if there is gentler distortion, whether it will be it will be high gentler distortion, or low gentler distortion. Now, before explaining this table, we shall take up this table in the next class. But I must tell you that <clears throat> all of you are aware that the T2G orbital phase the uh, in case of octahedral symmetry, T2G orbital phase the ligand less strongly than the EG orbitals. And as a result of this, we expect gentler, gentler distortion to be very high when there is asymmetric electron distribution in the in the EG orbitals. Because if there is asymmetric electron distribution in the EG orbital, then that will that kind of splitting leads to more stable stabilization whereas if we have a asymmetric electron distribution in the t2e orbitals then that kind of thing is relatively less that means is this delta 2 splitting is much smaller compared to delta 1 splitting though in this figure it may not appear like that but splitting in the t2e orbital due to entire distortion elongation or compression is relatively much smaller than the splitting in the EG orbital delta one is much much larger than delta two. As well as a result of this, whenever there is there is degeneracy arising out of the occupancy of the EG orbitals, that 
will give you stronger antler distortion. But whenever there is degeneracy arising from the occupation of the T2U orbital, that will give you less amount of distortion. And though I have told you that I, I shall explain it in the next class. So for instance, suppose we have a D9. So you have T2G6, EG3. So now T2G6, all T2G orbitals are equally filled with two unpaired electron. But when you have EG3, then there is one EG orbital which will contain two unpaired ele two electrons and there will be another EG orbital which will contain one electron. So now you have a you have a degenerate system in the EG orbital, whether you will put the unpaired electron in the X square minus Y square, Z square orbital. So for this kind of thing, when you have the degeneracy in the EG orbital, that leads to very high kind of Handler distortion. Similarly, if you have a T2G6 EG1 configuration, so when you, have, when you have a T2G6 EG1 configuration, question is whether unpaired electron will go to X square minus Y square or Z square. So since you have that kind of problem, so there handler distortion will be high. Again, if you have a T2G3 EG1 D4 system high spin, you will have a high handler distortion. So Whenever you have antler distortion arising from the occupancy of the EG orbital, right? Say like the T2G3 EG1, this high spin D4, or the low spin D7 or D9. For this kind of systems, there will be strong, very strong antler distortion. On the other hand, for other kind of system like TT1, TTG3, uh, TTG1, TTG2, low spin TTG4, that means whenever you have dental distortion arising from the T2G occupancy, then that kind of dental distortion will be relatively lower. So we can explain whether there will be dental distortion or not. Deep, uh, based on the electronic configuration and we can also say whether electronic distortion will be very strong or relatively quite weak depending on whether the occupancy, uh, degenerate occupancy is actually uh, occurring in the EG orbital or T2E orbital. If the degenerate occupancy is in the T2E orbital, it will be of, it will be of less less distortion if the occupancy of the e orbital is responsible for the degeneracy then the antler distortion will be relatively much higher so i stop it here in the next class i shall discuss this table uh, in a more thorough way thank you any question no sir thank you so either you are not listening or i am